All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode number 26 of the Movement is Medicine podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Carr. Um, and my very special guest today is Miss Pat Van Galen. Pat, welcome. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Kevin. Love it. Love Movement is Medicine. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that don't know Pat, um, you know, she is, she does it all. She's a teacher, trainer, coach, and she's been at this longer than I've been alive. Uh, I think you said in your bio, like 45 plus years of experience coaching, teaching, and lecturing in the world of fitness. And it all goes back to being a Springfield College alumni, as it seems in this industry. Uh, a lot of roads lead back to Springfield College. Um, she has a master's degree in exercise science and cardiac rehab, numerous certifications. And what I love most about Pat is that the name of like her business and her brand is actually how she lives and what she teaches, and that's active and agile. Um, and so you'll find Pat real you know, speaking on a bunch of topics, but lots about um, staying active with aging, reducing disability, and um, living actively and uh, improving your health even into your later years of life. And that's really why um, we wanted to bring Pat on as a guest speaker at the 2023 MBSC Spring Seminar that's on April 1st and 2nd. She has come and spoken at MBSC multiple times, as well as at conferences all around the country with Perform Better, um, with ICAA, MedFit, a bunch of other um, conferences. And she does an amazing job and brings an amazing amount of energy. So I thought having her on this episode would be a great way for those of you who might not know her to learn more about her and for her to share some of the amazing knowledge that she has, Pat. So um, hopefully I didn't miss anything in that introduction, but um, I, I, I really think you'll be a great resource here. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. That was a very nice introduction. Um, so, so, Pat, I mean, you've been at this for he says this is 45 plus years of experience of teaching and coaching. Um, and it's, it's kind of led you to here, but maybe if you could kind of back it up, rewind here um, to kind of how you got started in this industry and then kind of what led you to the path and the passion about the things that you're speaking about now. Well, my history is kind of long, so I'm going to try. <laughs> That's fine. We got time. Um, Kevin mentioned uh, Springfield College. Well, I grew up in a very, 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 very active uh, home. Um, anything on ice, snow, water, we all did it. This is before Title IX happened. So my sports was basically play and survive three brothers, outdoors, <laughs> all sports, everything. So that's where I got my love for movement. And at that time, there wasn't really training. So I ended up going to Springfield College to become a PE major. And, um, you know, it was a co had a coaching minor on the side, but then I ended up teaching health PE and believe it or not, math for three years in the public school. And I coached uh, field hockey, volleyball, basketball, track and field and gymnastics. I did that for three years. And I said, that's enough of that. Okay. <laughs> Love the coaching. Uh, it was super. I enjoyed the kids, but enough. Cause I was in those days, PE teachers did it all. You did yep. it. Yeah. Which was great. We knew what we were doing, at least we thought we did anyway. <laughs> and then uh, went back to Springfield, got my master's, um, ex phys in uh, cardiac rehab. And uh, then I spent 10 years in Cleveland, Ohio. And this is really where I got more into the corporate health, corporate fitness. Um, used to set up and, and train all the staff for various corporate fitness centers like Standard Oil, it was called Ohio in those days. But then I also got very much into the whole ergonomics and injury risk reduction stuff with uh, Stouffer's Frozen Foods, UPS, and all of that. Um, it was really cool. It was a job task analysis. I used to do it. I used to go and watch and participate and follow. And yeah, I even got to climb the hook and ladder with the Cleveland firefighters. That was pretty cool. Give me that more than I did. Anyway, so well, I had a, developed a great appreciation for the whole health, fitness, performance, occupational health and safety. I did that for 10 years. Wow. And then I met, got married <laughs> and I, uh, my husband was foreign service. So that's when we went around the globe. Wow. And uh, it was a Singapore, Beijing, Hong Kong, Virginia, Beijing, Paris, Berlin, 15 years overseas. So every one of those posts I had to recreate myself. And that's pretty much when I formed my uh, company. And I was 
teaching, coaching, uh, lecturing. Um, I started the Singapore Fitness Instructor Association back in 1990. So this was grassroots in Asia. Oh, my God. Uh, the uh, Asian Association of Sport Performance and Physical Fitness. I did a lot in Asia for years. That's why nobody knew me here. I didn't live here. <laughs> Amazing. So, uh, Anyway, it was fantastic. It was hard to start up over over again, but I ended up working in executive health promotion for hospitals, clinics. I did a lot of clinical stuff. But then my co- my kids, I'm coaching and teaching and doing coaches clinics because back in that, uh, back right around the mid early 90s is when this whole functional training thing came out. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, hello, this is what we should have been doing for decades because it never made sense to me. Uh, growing up with a movement background, not just a lifting background. So anyway, um, yeah, it was fantastic. I even did a nine-month PhD intervention when I lived in Hong Kong on uh, functional training in postmenopausal women. I never published because we moved too much. Never stayed in <laughs> any finish it. But anyway, it's, it's, it's done. I learned a lot. The ladies were great. And yeah, since since 90, I've been in this whole thing of shifting towards aging. And then probably the last 25 years, it's been all about let's age well, live better, move better, because you can. If you invest, you can. And so um, when I, I uh, found Mike Boyle, and when he used to write articles for training and conditioning, and mm-hmm. then uh, that's how I got, I'm like, this guy's my philosophy. Yeah. This is it. So um, that's how I got to know these guys. And when I did live in Albany for a couple of years, that's where I'm originally from, um, I used to be able to drive over to these guys and do stuff with them. But, um, yeah, ever since, it's just now I, I still teach, I still coach, I still do that. But more of my time now is, is educating the general folks and coaches and trainers about this active aging thing. <laughs> Well, you know, hearing your background um, being so variable from being in, you know, uh, physical education and sport coaching and occupational health and now into functional training, it makes sense seeing you and hearing your philosophy because of the varied backgrounds. Like you embody all of those things. Like you live actively every day. You, like, look out the window behind you out in Big Sky. For those of you who don't know, she's coming to us from Big Sky, Montana, so she can live that active life that she talks about. Um, and, you know, it, it makes sense hearing the way that you speak about how people should live and how to manage disability when I think about the um, occupational health background. And, and so hearing all that kind of brings all the pieces together, I know, for me and for those of you uh, who, who are listening. Um, and so... What I know you've really spearheaded and like one of the things you're going to talk about, you know, the aging accelerance is the, uh, the tagline for your, your lecture at the winter seminar. Um, and, and you've done a lot for me to help to better service our clients at MBSC. I can definitely say I mean, you're always a big hit when we bring you in, uh, to come speak. Um, but for those of you that are, that are listening, I know one of the questions I got, I put up a little prompt today, uh, for people to, you know, say, Hey, if you have any questions for Pat, please. Uh, put them in the chat. And one of them was, was really good. Uh, I want to actually start with and and what the, the gentleman that asked the question said is how should we think about approaching our training as we move through the different decades of life? How should we think about changing what we do or maybe not changing what we do, depending on what you say, as you move from twenties to thirties to forties to fifties to sixties, seventies, and beyond that in staying active, how should we think about that progression uh, adjusting because we know people naturally outside the gym tend to change their activity levels for better or worse as they age. And so as coaches or the average gym consumer listening to this, how should they think about adjusting their training along that timeline? This is a good question. Um, yeah. the, the one, first of all, I always tell people in their Thirties, middle thirties, get after it then. You're a peak, grown, mature adult at thirty-five. Invest in yourself. That's what I like to hear at thirty-five, fat kid. That's uh, there you go. They pick the right age. So start then if you have. If mm-hmm. you have, good for you. But um, I think with the whole, um, I, I came up with a little system, and I'll explain it. Then you'll see where we fit. 
Okay. I came up with something called a hardiness. How robust, resilient, and durable do you want to be? How healthy, how functionality, you mentioned that word. Um, hardiness is all of those. It's functional mm-hmm. health of all the systems, not just the musculoskeletal system. And there's five pillars that support that hardiness. And those pillars are grounded in the cement of daily, weekly, and seasonal habits, patterns, and practices. People want the granule fix for the big problem. And I'm sorry, that's not, doesn't work. Um, <laughs> it doesn't. People want, if I take this supplement, oh my God, my mitochondria are going to be fantastic. I'm all the energy in the world. If I meditate, my stress is going to go away. No, that's not how it works. It's your habits, patterns, and practices over days, weeks, seasons, and decades that matter. So that's your question. The, the second pillar is the movement pillar. The first is purpose. Second is movement. Third, nutrition. Fourth, rhythms of, of your day, rest, recovery, regen. And the fifth is the stress pillar. But that movement pillar has three big rocks. They all have three big rocks, not zillions of granules. You know of Stephen uh, Covey with his jars and the rocks. Yep. <laughs> so you've got motion and locomotion and chores and labor. That's movement. That's, that's rock one. Rock two is play. Recreation, sport, hobbies, passions, adventures. What do you like to do for fun? And then there's the training, the training rock. So we need to train throughout the decades, number one, for health. And that means cardiovascular health, metabolic health, bone strength, muscle mass, um, uh, the whole thing nowadays with pre-diabetes and pre-frailty, it's, it's bad. So that's the number one, health and well-being first. So there's a certain level of training, assuming you don't do much else, which unfortunately, it's kind of sad that's how it is. Mm-hmm. You don't do much else. Uh, the training rock is very, 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 very important. Um, but that's, that's the health part first. Now, if you want to play, you better be more robust. That's all I mm-hmm. think. So you, you ramp up the level of robustness based on what you want to be able to do. And so if you're looking at, um, I'm going to start with the 35 group there because pretty much most uh, people aren't getting paid to play a sport. They're not professional. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if we do it for fun and for social and for family traditions and all that kind of stuff. So health is first, absolutely. And musculoskeletal health as well too. And this is typically where the younger active ones run into trouble. They beat the crap out of themselves. So musculoskeletally, they have to change it up. Then you got the other folks who never did much, didn't beat up their musculoskeletal system, but they're a metabolic cardiovascular health mess. Mm -hmm. So we have to adjust our training based on what we need and then what we want to be able to do. And I think it was, it was on strength coach. Somebody was asking about, uh, uh, it was barbell lifts. Now I can't remember Would you probably read it, Kevin. I'm sure on there. About when do I switch over from a bar, yep. possibly kettlebells or dumbbells? Yep. And to be honest with you, right now what I do, I do kettlebells and dumbbells. I haven't touched a bar in probably 15 years. Yeah. I don't think I need to because I'm healthy, I'm active. I can achieve what I want to achieve from strength and power and doing hip stuff for what I like to do to play. And that's mm-hmm. how I look at it. So we layer on based on what we want to be able to do. But we can't be an idiot about it. <laughs> yeah. We, there's... Choosing the right tool for the job is you nailed that on the head. I think I tell people all the time, yeah. um, you know, it, it, choose what you need. And you don't need more than that. Like you said, Pete, you're being selective in your choices to serve a purpose for what play, as you said, um, you want to prepare yourself for. Now, if someone is into 
weight lifting, power <laughs> lifting, um, Spartan events. Well, then you, you, that's different. You have to train for those events. Um, but that's not typically, and they're out there, you're 50, 60, 70, 80 years no. old. Um, and the ones you see, like I, I was in a relay, a mountain uh, relay this summer, and uh, yeah, I was probably one of the oldest ones there, but there were people older than me doing these trail runs. And they're not That's old. awesome. But no. a lot of these people, you got to remember, a lot of these people never played team sports where they were mm -hmm. cutting and, you know, a lot of a serious agility work. And collisions and contact. So you see that. And yeah. You have new knees and hips. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's amazing when you see uh, former athletes as they get older. They're usually the ones that are the toughest as once you're in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Mm -hmm. um, they're the ones with all the replacement parts typically um, when you see them in that later half of life. <laughs> yeah. And, and if that's part of your well being, being active yeah. in sport adventure, that's part of health and well-being. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. We're making trade-offs. I always say, you know, you're always making trade-offs. And so, lots of times, sometimes the trade-offs are worth it, right? Um, I know a lot of people who, you know, they have a bunch of, you know, ailments from their years of competitive sports, but they're healthy as a horse and they've managed it. And you're con always considering and making trade-offs. And that's really what a lot of this is about when we talk about as we age, what trade-offs are you willing to make for health and fitness? Um, and, and, and where do they make the most sense? And the thing is that people fight to keep it, keep mm -hmm. their fitness and their strength and their power and their gait and their mobility, stability, and all that stuff. It takes smaller doses to stay there. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's, you're better off shooting high and fighting to maintain. I mean, we always, I remember you and I have talked a bunch about this idea of health span, right? And thinking about um, trying to maximize your health span till the very, very end rather than just lifespan, it's keeping, you know, your activity and your longevity. But like you said, if you're able to at, the peak time, apparently 35 is peak, so I feel great uh, about that. But if, I, if I'm if i able to you know, get to the level I'm at now, then it's much easier to fight that slow decline that is a biology of uh, the entropy that will eventually start to happen than once you're later in life to try to fight your way up that mountain, right? And so, uh, yeah, you want to think about putting on as much as you can, accelerating your health uh, as much as you can when it's easier and you have the biological advantages um, and then doing all the different things to keep it as you, you head into the later years. It's like we talk about with uh, kids, put the bone in the bank early. Mm -hmm. Put the muscle in the bank early. Put the motor skills in the bank early. But by 35, you're a grown adult. So do it. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I, I want to back up to something that you touched on earlier when you talked about uh, breaking down you know, exercise and physical activity in those three categories, right? Mm -hmm. So training, like people would think about in the gym, lifting weights, functional training, whatever you do for exercise volitionally. Play. So um, like you said, whether that's you know recreational activities, playing sports, um, exploration in that second category. And then third, moving through your daily life, um, you know, whatever things you have to do to, you know, housework, cleaning around your house, you know, whatever the, the basic non -vol volitional exercise. Um, and what you tend to see is you always, you see people who just might have one category. And I can think of a client that almost fits into each bucket, but they don't check off all the categories and they all I have a shortcoming as, as their physical health goes in some way because of that. Like I see people who might come to me and they move, they might get a lot of steps because they're moving around their house and going to work every day, but they don't do any player exploration um, and they don't participate in physical, um, any sort of uh, physical exercise. And so that might be the person that comes to me with back pain. Um, and the solution for them is often, let's just get moving. Yes. Right. And they, they, they get a lot better with little doses. Yes. And then on the other side, I might see someone who participates in a lot of exercise. I can think of about um, some people who are huge exercise enthusiasts, enthusiasts, maybe go five days a week, different classes. They lift weights. Yep. But 
they're very rigid in their in their physical health in that they have no exploration and outside of the time they exercise they really don't move at all and when you look at the research as far as all cause mortality goes one of the biggest things that help us stay alive longer if you want to put it as simply as possible is just moving enough throughout the day outside of voluntary exercise and so is that something – how do you speak to somebody to get them to understand that all three parts of this are important, not just going to the gym every single day? Um, a couple things. I always – especially from with a new client or you know, getting to know people, I always dig and dig till I find something they either have great memories of doing when they yep. grow up. I'd love to do dot, dot, dot again. Or the other one is, you know, I've always wanted to learn how to da 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 da. Mm-hmm. Or what, something. Or if there's an event coming up, you know, I have to learn to do ballroom dance at my daughter's wedding. Well, let's go. Yep. Something that. that they can sink their teeth into. And then, as far as just uh, plain old plain old movement, um. One of the things I always share, I'm, I know Kevin and the CFC and everybody listening, they should have read something about the blue zones. If you have yep. you've got to take lessons from these people. No, I'm never g- going to become a sheep herder in something. <laughs> <laughs> it might be fun, but <laughs> yeah. the lessons, these people live, they have the most centenarians who live really well for a long time. There's no gyms, no training, none of that. They work the land, and they pretty much move every 20 minutes. I Mm -hmm. say exercise. They just move. Do something. And that's kind of how I grew up. We didn't have remotes and stuff, but you moved a lot. Mm -hmm. And you look at our parents, my parents. In in the 50s, there wasn't a lot of fat people. No, no. Now, we didn't have all the processed food and all that crap either, but we moved a lot more. So um, one of the things I do with, say, uh, newbie clients or novices to physical activity and training, I think the best tool is um, just a simple pedometer. Let's see Mm -hmm. the steps you take a day, a thousand. Okay, you're stuck to your computer, so let's try to do more. And I've had 80-year-olds completely get off their medication just by using a pedometer and me going to their house twice a week to do band and squats and, you know, stuff like that, completely off medications at 80? Are you kidding me? Unbelievable. 50 pounds just by doing that. It's a mind thing, but I I always push. I always say all movement matters. All. Yeah. And I think the pedometer can like, I mean, the nice thing is everyone has a pedometer now, whether they even know they have it or not. This thing is the best and worst thing for fitness, I think, um, because it's part of the reason people don't move, but there can be some bright spots. And like, so for instance, now we're doing this my zone challenge at the gym. You know what, what you touched on it when you were talking about people saying, Hey, I always wish I did this or like I going back to things they loved deep down. Even if they might not seem it on the surface, everybody has a little bit of, you know, a- athlete in them. They have a little bit of competitiveness in them. Um, and it's about, you said, asking the right questions and finding their motivation. And so even with this My Zone Challenge, some of the people you would think at our gym that would be not interested at all in something like this are all like, okay, I'm trying to think about, okay, now that I, if I get more maps, maybe I'll go, I'll go walk, take out the dog for an extra walk every day. And then they'll say, you know what, maybe I'll add that extra workout or, you know what, I'm going to wear it when I go uh, to hockey this week. So they're starting to think more about moving because of this external metric. And likewise, with the pedometer, I, I actually told the story in the lap episode with Brendan. So I have a guy who he's, you said, stuck at your computer. He, we started, I got him to start tracking um, his steps at the start of the pandemic because I'm like, you aren't moving a lot and now you're really not moving a lot. And he was averaging, he averaged the year before uh, his average steps per day when we looked at the end of the year was 3,300. So real low, right? 
But, and he was a guy who, like, I didn't even broach the conversation of steps until we were a couple of years in because he's a guy who's, like, he begrudgingly came to the gym one day a week. But then I got him to say – he did, yes. And so what I started to do is be like, okay, let's just see if we can do a little bit more. So in between your time at the computer, just take uh, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, take a break, do some push-up squats, walk around, come back. And we just did that. And he got up like a modest amount the next year. I think it was like 4,600, right? But that's a year's worth of data yeah. of 4,600. So it's more steps. And then each year, now he's up to around 7,000. And so, that's but magic number too. That's, I, that's what I said to him. I said, let's get to like 7,000. Okay. But now he's looking at the thing every day being like, Oh, I got to get my steps in. And so you, like you said, the power of a pedometer, you tell these, you know, you know, 80 old women that you're working with, they're doing bands. Hey, you got to get your steps in today. They're like, all right, let's go. And they go and they start walking. Yeah. It's uh, just I, people. Well, I think that our field that, starting back with fitness, did a bad job with the whole fitness thing. It was all about fat loss and looks. And and finally, people are getting a health message. And yeah. so any movement is medicine. And so we're, we're getting away from that. So that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, and, and, I mean, if you, as you guys know, it's getting to know your people. It's getting to know your people. You build relationships with them. Even this guy who hated to come to the gym, he only came once a week. He came to see you. Yeah. yeah. So that's what we do. We, we have more influence on people than any primary care physician. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the amount of FaceTime that you yeah. get with the people you see is – you see the, your doctor like once a year. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know what the stat was I put in that lecture before. And it's just like the average amount of uh, time you'd see your – uh, primary care practitioner year on average is like one and a half times per year. And that doesn't even, that takes into account the people who go like multiple times, like every month and the people who don't go at all. Whereas if you go to a personal trainer two times a week for a year and show up 80% of the time, you get a hundred visits. <laughs> so it's like, think about that as far as the long-term impact you can have on your health. I don't, even the best doctor yeah, you might not have a like a good personal relationship with, whereas you know everything about your client's life. You know their personal relationships more, way more. You know everything about their life way more than you be actually usually become a big part of their life. So your ability to start to influence the way that they think about their health yeah. uh, is is huge, and that's a big responsibility when you say it that way. Um, but you know, if you can just start to get little bits of walking, little bits of active activity that they start to think about. And you have to think about a long-term relationship. Again, this fitness industry is always this microwave approach. They want to do everything quickly. Uh, whereas we always say it's like the slow cooker approach. Like these changes I made with that guy were over the course of years. Uh, not, not if I, if I said to him in year one, let's, let's double your steps a day to 7,000. He probably wouldn't still see me. He'd be like, all right, this relationship isn't worth it at this point. Um, but if you think, Hey, eventually I'll get you there. And you think of it that way. And you think in terms of years, like you're, we're trying to train into our eighties, right? Then, then you can think long-term, then you can think long-term if that's what your priorities are. Yeah. I think one, one niche that, um, folks in our profession need to do is you got to know your local OBGYN, nurse practitioner, internist, and primary care. The specialist, yep. that's all fine and dandy, but when you have known disease, you go to cardiac rehab or you go to the physical therapist. Where if it's something known, we got to get them at the free, at the pre. Mm -hmm. The pre stuff, the pre-diabetes, the pre-waist went up two inches, the pre- all of those, you know, the, the lipid thing, the blood sugar thing, it's, yeah, we got to intervene way earlier. That's why 35 is really kind of the magic spot to start if you missed it. And don't yeah. stop. It's all no. There's no programs anymore. It's not starting out. No, it's like till you drop. And if you drop, doing it won't happen. If you're 90, boom. Look at that. You did it. I'm sure that's what people are hoping for. And I did a lecture for PD perform better about women, especially you live with better. 13 years dependent is the average. 
13 years of... Me- 13 no. years of dependence, meaning, you know, disability, strength, power, mobility, all those things. Not to mention what's, you know, the brain thing. What's good for the health span is good for the brain span. So, I mean, every system is affected by movement. Every single one. And they it's a, it's yeah, and it's amazing when you think about it. you say thirteen years dependent where you, where you can't necessarily live alone. You need someone else to help you get around. You need some people uh, to help take care of you. Maybe you live in a facility uh, for a portion of that. And to everyone listening, like that sounds like everyone's like worst nightmare, like that they don't have their independence. But at the same time, it's so hard for the average twenty, thirty, even forty year old person having a good time in their life to think that's going to be me someday. Um, um, and, and I actually heard this thing. It's funny that you say this. I heard, uh, listen to a Peter Atia clip today. He was talking about, he was saying that they, a question, um, a thought experiment for people who are like in their twenties. And they say, and he said, you know, if, if right now, if you could trade places with someone like Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger, would you to a, like a broke 20 year old and the majority of people always say, Oh no, absolutely not. I'd rather have my youth. Right. Even though those are two of the richest people in the world. And I mean, they probably have the ailments of an average person that age. But, you know, they they still seem from the outside, at least that they're doing okay. Everybody would choose their youth. Right. And so I think it's you said 35. It speaks to me like I've always tried to think about getting older. But once I had a kid, I really started to think about maintaining my health as I got older. And so it can be hard sometimes for people to think like the things that you do now, the deposits now. And the habits, more importantly, that you build now are the things that are going to allow you to have more independence there. Because where you kind of said it about your pillars, we're an accumulation of those habits externally. And if you build the habits when you're young and you're able to maintain them, you'll look at in your 70s and your 80s and you're like, oh, wow, I'm glad I did that. But if you get there and you don't have it, you're not going to turn it around the other direction, you know? It's never too late to make change, but the longer you have all these other issues, don't think you're going to regenerate. They, you know, yeah, they're doing them. We probably won't recognize aging in the next 30 years, but they're doing in the lab, the pharmaceuticals, Mm -hmm. the nutraceuticals, all the senolytics and all this stuff. You still got to have the pillars. You still have to have the pillars. So, yeah. Yeah. but the other time it hits people, Kevin, is when their parents start, uh, oh, could you come over and do this? Could you come, come over and do that? I can't do it. Or Baba. Yeah. So sometimes it takes having a child, which, you know, now you're thinking a little different. But when your parents start leaning on you, uh, that's another whole issue. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that's something I deal with now. My mom has an autoimmune thing completely Here's a woman that was running back in the 70s. I mean, golf, skier, physical labor, you know, all that stuff. But something, we think it might have been a tick before they wow. knew what Lyme disease was. Yeah, before they even knew what it was. So she has, it's called, if you've ever seen that movie, Father Stew. Yep. My mom has that disease. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it wastes your quads like it's a yeah. she is living in in a place now where she's safe. The falls are the big issue. So mm-hmm. but when when it hits your parents, it hits you hard as well. My father, on the other hand, that's another whole story. He went out in style. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Um, when you, when you talk about fall prevention is something that I know you've talked about a lot. Um, and it's something that we always talk to our coaches at the gym when they have clients who get older. I said, one fall prevention in the gym, but fall prevention, the things we're doing are helping keeping these people vertical and keeping them on their feet. So what are some things that, you know, people can do in the gym that will help reduce their chances of fall? Cause we know an accidental fall over 60 for many people is really the beginning of the downward slope. So what are things that people can do to reduce that from happening? Well, this happens to be a little plug for CFSC because you got the buckets <laughs> right. And what you guys do in your prep, your warm-up, your movement prep, I know it has lots of different names, but anything with the fast feet, 
anything, agility ladders, your leaping sticks, your all of that um, body weight power work is absolutely fantastic for fall risk reduction. Of course, you're working on strength too and you're working on power, but body weight power where you're moving your body. And that's anything in that category. Um, and then, of course, there's always fun drills that are much more reactive, but you can do that with your people. You've seen me do stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And with drills you do with your athletes, they're just scaled differently. So, you know, you might be in front of a room, you got your group, come at me, back it up, go right, go left, you know, what's my fingers, what, you know, games. Games yeah. that are safe, but challenging. And there's that little precipice. So, um, I think the biggest thing I see um, is coaches ignore that. Yep. Unless you're training athletes. This is absolutely key for adults. So, the, the, the ladder work, I mean, I use the leaping stick. I have every combination of crossover things going. Um, we, we have fun. That's fun. You know? Yeah. So, um, not too much hopping. Not a big hop fan. But gate drills, anything you can do, you know, your hip switch drills, reciprocal arm legs, I do all of that with my people. Marches, anything you alluded to it, but anything that connects, shoulder girdle, the pelvic girdle with reciprocal arms, independent hips, huge for fall risk reduction. Absolutely huge. So, you know, it's, yeah. Sorry, Kevin, you know me. No, I'm going to let, I want you to keep going. I'll come back to my question. And women, to get them in that athletic stance is absolutely key to reduce the risk of falls. For falls. Yeah. They want to be up. It's just like skiing. Same yep. thing. Get your butt down. But da- yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing. So, um, but all, anything, uh, I believe, and this is why I, you know, like Mike Boyle's philosophy, this is before he was really kind of training adults. With all, you know, athletes. I'm like, yeah. it's the same exact principle. I mean, it's unbelievable that it's almost something with the adult training that we backed into. And I know, like Michael tell you, like when they started, they had no interest in training general population. It was only training competitive high school, college and professional athletes. Yeah. And, and then there were some parents that were like, well, can I work out here? Right. And so Michael's like, all right, we're just going to take the same approach, but we're going to take out the Olympic lifting and, you know, some of the heavy sprinting and some of the things that might be too much for you, but we're going to do pretty much the same thing. And if you look at our program side by side, they don't look too much different when you look at the adult and the athlete program. Um, but you back into the right thing because you're pretty much just starting as far across that side of the scale as you can and just bringing it back enough to whatever their entry point is. That's it, totally. That's what we should be doing with that. I call it the skills bucket, the general balance. But that's the thing that's really missing unless they're uh, fit and strong and powerful enough and agile enough to play sports. Yep. And and it's funny, like, I, I train a lot of adults with a ton of uh, clients um, in the end, like, that would fall into that, like, active adult you know, bucket. But the thing you always hear them joke about is like, ah, you know, I don't have my athleticism anymore. And they seem that there are people, someone who played a sport when they were a kid. And then you go to do the skipping and the warm up, and they're all over the place, same arm, same leg, or they struggle with the ladder and they struggle with the med ball. And they were like, I used to be a competitive athlete and they joke about it. But to me, that's almost like the first sign of that you're losing yes, totally. that ability to, like you said, Cross body coordinate, rotate your hips and shoulders independently, be able to balance on one leg. And so to me, I think that is our missing. That person still might be strong. They might still have some cardiovascular health, but that's the target. And to me, I think, okay, that we might joke around about them being like, oh, I lost my athleticism, but I'd say we're going to get that back at least to some degree so that you can move agile again, not because you're necessarily trying to play in competitive sports, but you want to maintain as much functionality as you can into your later years. Yep. Yes, as coaches, we're supposed to make sure people don't get hurt in the gym. Good God, not on my watch. But we want to prepare them to go out and do things. And if you're, you know, on a hiking trail, it's bumpy and lumpy. It's not smooth. 
you know, it's got issues that you have to deal with. So if we mm-hmm. don't teach people to move their feet or coach them to react, then we're, we're barking up the wrong tree, in my opinion. I always say I feel like uh, one of the best end stage rehab things would just be telling someone to go for a hike for a lower leg thing. Like when I when I feel like I'm hiking and go, especially when I'm going down, I always think like this is probably the best thing for my feet and my ankles is like challenging as it is where you constantly have a different rock surface and and a soft surface. And you're trying to think about where your footing is. I always think like this is probably the best thing for my brain and the best thing for my knees, ankles, feet, as far as keeping them resilient uh, as we get older, because uh, it can require so much concentration and uh, of effort and, and uh, agility as far as the lower body goes. Yeah. No, I- it was a, a lot of up vertical. So you're kind of yeah. you know, like trying to squeeze some up, but when you go down, your brain gets tired. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, yeah. Surface is nicer than a road. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I know. And so uh, the big thing, like, you know, we always try to put emphasis emphasis on in that warm up period is okay. We want to see someone go forwards. I want to see someone go backwards. I want to see them go sideways. I want to see them rotate. Can I check all those movement boxes off? And cause everybody in their daily life lives in this little sagittal plane world, right? They get out of bed, they sit in a chair, they go to work, they never rotate. They never go sideways. They never go backwards. And it's amazing when you get people moving again, how uncomfortable they are when you're like, okay, let's do a backpedal, even if we're just going to walk it. And it's like they don't have the sensory perception behind them uh, or beside them to kind of understand where they are in space. And when you're a kid, you just do things um, and you're you're comfortable with it. And so to me, I'm like, okay, multiple sets sometimes in between. Like I, I was doing this recently with a couple of my clients. Throw med ball, backpedal, ladder drill, lateral bound, throw med ball, backpedal. And sometimes you like, you think of it as a warm drill, but I'm like, no, this is a sensory drill for this person as much as anything else. Yeah. That's like, mm-hmm. they're in their 50s and 60s, but they want to ski, they want to bike, they want to hike, and they get it. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing about that is more fun. Yes, way more fun. Yeah. And I said it, Ian Jeffries, I remember, he said, fun is not frivolous, you know. (laughs) And he's a fun guy, too. He's a fun guy. Yeah. Um, and, and so another thing too, with the people aging, you talk about exploration, whether it's playing sports, but then continuing to do things that just challenge their brain. I thought of it cause you were talking about, you know, hiking downhill. I think about the clients that we have, um, who are older, who have so much liveliness, um, and outside of the fact that the exercise is chronically and physical movement is chronically a part of their life. They're people who I find continue to try to keep learning and challenging themselves, with new things. Uh, it's very often you see people get to that midpoint in life and there's no new hobbies, no new things they've learned, no new things they've tried. And I think about, I have a, a couple of older clients. Um, one of them just took up water painting not that long ago. Now he's like puts paintings and shows. Uh, they're learning a new language. Um, they just got, yes. Learn something new. Third stage, semi-post retired. You got to ramp up for something new. Music, art, mm-hmm. sports, adventures, travel, woodworking, anything. Not the bo- the box, the idiot box. Yeah, yeah. The idiot, yeah. You think about the idea of like these people in retirement. The idea is like go to a bit beach and kick your feet up, and it's like that's probably the worst thing that you could do. Um, whereas you think use all this time for something to keep yourself stimulated. They always talk about, you know, the idea of, you know, the person who retires and has a heart attack like the day later, right? Um, And because a lot of people, they're being kept sharp and kept lively by their occupation in in, whether that's something that's beautiful, something that they're passionate about or something that's sad because that's just what they do for a living. The reality is most people, uh, that's the majority of the time they're going to spend in their life. And so you have to fill that bucket with something. Um, to, to keep yourself sharp. 
60 years to be around another 30 to 40 years. What the hell you got to be doing? You have to have a reason to get up in the morning. He studied these subjects um, in the blue zone, and just people who live a long time, they have a reason to get up in the morning. Mm-hmm. And that that is absolutely critical. And it's going to evolve. It's going to change. Yeah. Something that that gets you up. I mean, this is why I like to train at this gym here. They're all like your age and younger. Like, yeah. You, you know, um, but, but they're, yeah, you have to also intergenerational. It has to be, must. I mean, it's sad that a lot of these nursing homes and they're all older people. They try to, to uh, hire young staff to keep people hopeful. But it's hard when you see everybody. Yeah. Down, yeah. Down, down. And uh, yeah, there's, they're looking for other solutions for intergenerational living and all these kinds of things. Um, but yeah, it, you, you want the, the exercise is pro- the movement, I will say, is probably the most potent weapon we have against biological aging. I would say that number one. Number two would be the food. But it's really what's happened now is people have lost track of the big picture. We're trying to do all these pieces. No, it's the rhythm of your day, the rhythm of your week and your season. It's it's not, you know, all these little granules of quick fixes. I, I, I don't like that word hack because hack to me to me mm-hmm. means squawk. You're yep. not putting in the rocks. You're not doing the big stuff. You want these little things to fix everything. That, that's that's not how it works. Well, um, Dan, uh, Dan Buechner, his he said, how did he say? He said, uh, aging well, there is, no, he said, there's no silver bullet. It's more like silver buckshot. So <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. and he said, and I'm not saying exactly right, but he says, people who live long and well, longevity happens to them because of the way they live. Mm-hmm. It's the rhythm of the day. And if you study all, you know, aside from our physical stuff, but they're connected socially. They have a reason to get up in the morning. Many of them have a very strong faith in a power much bigger and better than themselves. That's, according to Butner, it's like nine extra years there. And they, yeah. they they socialize. They eat a plant based diet. Yeah. So. Yep. And it it goes back to this. People always talk about in in pain science the idea of the biopsycho and social approach. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And they mm-hmm. always kind of say when people say biopsycho social, you hear people just think about pain science. But yeah. the bigger picture is that health in general mm-hmm. is in inputs of biological, psychological, and uh, 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 social inputs. Mm-hmm. that go into your health and that that's not complete without having all of them. Like you said, the social thing is something that most people don't think about at all, mm-hmm. but how much your social life, the people you're surrounded with, um, how your interactions are um, impact your health. It's like, we also know, um, you know, how economic impact impacts people overall health. It's a bigger picture approach. And that's what makes it intimidating to a lot of people. But at the same time, I always tell people, well, I almost think it's empowering when you say, okay, now just start with something in, in those categories. Um, because if you're continually looking for a singular approach, like you said, the silver bullet, you're going to be, it's a, going to be a search forever. Um, and, and you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to be a happy person. Yes. You know, choose happiness in strange ways. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's it right there. Um, and so the intergenerational piece is something most people don't even think about. But again, when I think about some of my clients who are older, they're the ones that call me and be like, hey, do you want to go out somewhere or you want to come to this thing? Um, and they're socializing with every everybody in the gym of all different ages. And that's such an obvious thing to me is that they're living outside of their narrow world that that they that you said many people kind of their everything narrows for them as they go or the way they move the way they explore things and then how they socialize so um and and that, that mm-hmm. you well, person you create this environment and they want to be around you 
whatever, but that's some of your buddies there. At yeah. The, uh, yeah. No, we, we create that. And I think that makes us very, very, very unique. We are health professionals. I mean, you look at a dietitian and a physician, um, very different. We create relationships. And I think there's some physical therapists that do a fantastic job, but it's starting in. They give you the boot. We, we, we're out there. Yeah. And, you know, so, um, but, yeah, so excited about this. It's, it's just become a passion of mine because people can do it. They can. It's the way and the pace at which they age. They can, they can, they can. And so as we kind of get into the, the hour here, I want to give you a, a chance to kind of plug your talk at the seminar. Um, so the title officially that is the Aging Accelerance Counter to Buffer. And so you're going to talk a lot about, you know, how much you can we can influence the pace at which we age. And so if you could kind of give people a, uh, a preview, a trailer, so to speak, of what you're going to be talking about, I think that would be great. A trailer? Yeah. Um. I think there's so much information now in all aspects of aging, people are completely overwhelmed. So it's definitely I, the hot thing right now. It's like, it's definitely, which I think is good and bad, right? The pendulum, people are yeah. talking about it, but it's almost like the information overload, right? Yeah, yeah. So what I've tried to do is take all the science and that I follow, which sometimes my head is completely spinning because it's all molecular <laughs> biology. That's what it is. Yeah. That's where you get all the research is right there in the cell, all the little organelles. We got the big picture here we're dealing with the body. One thing I'll tell you, when you go to one of Pat's lectures, you're going to get a ton of great references. That's <laughs> like whenever I hear you, I'm like, oh, I'm going to write that one. I'm going to go to PubMed. Uh, or you just send it to me because um, she always has a whole bunch of them. No, you do a great job. Like, I'm always like, oh, where'd she find this? And so, but yeah, go on, go on. I always say you always have the, the pulse on it, which is great. Well, Trump, sometimes, like you said, I'm spinning. But yeah. once again, really, uh, you're learning. And, uh, so anyway, the, if you think about aging, it's a process. And the rate at which we age is how we handle the various stressors in our life. There's a lot of them. There's physical stressors, emotional, mental, blah, blah, blah. But the four things that make you age faster, first and foremost, and this is our world, inactivity. That's the absolute worst thing you can do to yourself, number one. Number two, you have the inactivity, and then we start to add the insults, the assaults, the neglect. We get insulin resistance. Huge problem. We're mm -hmm. frontline on those two. Then as that process continues, we end up with what we call inflammation. Low-grade inflammation as we age, that's chronic, which affects every single freaking system in the body. Mm -hmm. And then we have the fourth one called immunosenescence. And what that is, is aging immune cells. So those are the four things that accelerate aging. Can we intervene? You're darn right we can. Look who survived COVID. Yeah. I mean, there's a ton of data that came out recently about that that was yeah. pretty staggering. Yes. So those are the things that um, accelerate aging. So what do we do about it? Well, we start building and buttressing those pillars with the three big rocks. And then... I'm gonna give. I'm going to give uh, uh, Brendan a little thing here, because uh, <laughs> I have the four eyes and I have five pillars. And in the movement pillar, there's the seven S training buckets. You guys use five, but it's very much the same. Yeah. And then we have the three Bs: <laughs> basics and benchmarks. And I Love it. Think that what Brendan has put together comes from all you guys gathering data over the years. The benchmarks for the strength and power are very achievable for adults if they can earn them and then fight to keep them. And mm -hmm. uh, I use that stuff a lot because I think they're doable. And yeah. the categories are there, especially the strength, I'm talking strength and power for those. But 
Um, I think they're very doable. And if you can can uh, achieve and maintain those on, say, a couple hits a week and two good sessions a week and then do other stuff outside, boy, you're, you're nailing it. You're pretty robust, assuming you're not drinking like a fish and, you know, all that. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so it's really, these are the accelerants. Let's try to buffer and counter these things. How can we do it in our daily life? And what are some things we could strive for? The benchmarks are things to strive for. And then, um, so that's kind of what the talk is all about because it's very doable. And I'm not talking about, you know, supplements and meditating for three hours and all this kind of stuff. No, I'm talking about let's get after it. And yeah. a lot of these things are more like pebbles and granules. They're nice to supplement, you know, my overall health. But if you don't have the rocks, you can yeah. get a jar with granules, but you're, you're missing. It's going to take you a while. You're going to miss a lot. Yeah, I mean, you just brought it all the way back to the Stephen Covey jar analogy. Um, so that's that's really good how you, you brought it in circle. But it's true. I think everyone wants to do what we call like majoring in the minors. They think, oh, this supplement I could take or, you know, this one type of training will solve it. And it's never ever that simple, unfortunately. And, um, you know, I, I'm really excited. I always come out of your talks energized um, because you have so much energy. Yeah. And and so if you think Pat is great uh, on the podcast, just wait till you see her in person. She's gonna, she has a ton of energy when she's up there speaking, but a ton of ideas and real practical ones at that. So it's um, that's what, what I'm really looking forward to. So um, real quick, I'm going to actually put you on the spot. I forgot to tell you about this. Um, typically at the uh, – you'll be fine. Typically at the very end, uh, Brendan and I always do a book recommendation. We always have a book recommendation. Um Whichever you want, whatever book you want to recommend. Okay. Um, anything, anybody, feel, anybody, period, your clients, regular people, read something from Buechner on the Blue Zones and take Buechner. that to home. Because I've always looked, I, I see his research, but I like his practical stuff too. Yep. Um, and I think it's. Simple, but not easy. Um, let's see. Oh, you're going to laugh at this. You know what I just read this morning? What? The Farmer's Almanac for 2023. Jenny. All right. People, people forget about the Farmer's Almanac. Yeah. Seriously, there's great stuff in there. So that's something I, I just read <laughs> this morning. So, really? Any predictions? What do we have for the predictions in 2023? Um. Twenty twenty two. All right. Hey, it's all up it's all looking good. That's what we want. Yeah. So um to stay on track with your kind of theme today, the book I'm gonna read and recommend is Spring Chicken by okay. Bill Gifford. Yeah. Super, super. You know, Dan John had recommended that one to me and I really enjoyed it because this guy talks from a personal point of view of like his his cause uh, for him. Um and you get a lot of good takeaways in there. So spring chicken, that'll be a, another one to kind of go with it. So <laughs> Quick one. It's a little paperback. It's only about this big. It's called Neurobics. Neurobics. O-B-I-C-S. It's all about the sensory stuff. Do something different every day. Mm -hmm. That's a really fun read. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, all right. People have their reading. They're to prepare. Now, this is good. Um, Well, Pat, um, you know, I'm jealous. You're going to go outside, enjoy nature out there behind you. You're out the heart of uh, Big Sky in the middle of winter, so I don't want to keep you too long. Um, but I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Um, I appreciate you coming on today, and um, I'm really looking forward to having you out. Um, for those of you listening, again, it's April 1st and 2nd, 2023, MBSC Spring Seminar. Um, we're going to have a ton of speakers. We have Jordan Syatt. Uh, we have uh, Scott Livingston. We have Pat, of course, along with myself, Michael Boyle, Vinny Toledo, Dan McGinley, and Eric Daddario. So our MBSC staff members, um, it's two days. Yeah, It's available online. You can live stream it. 
um, and watch it from home. You can also come in person to MBSC and the recordings will be available afterwards and it, it will be approved for CEUs. We're in the process of going through that now. Uh, we have an early bird special until January 18th. Um, so take advantage of that before the price goes up. And so if you have any questions, you just let us know, but it's going to be a great event. Um, always a fun weekend. And I think you can get a lot out of Pat's presentation as well as everybody else's. Yeah. Along with just new new stuff, and you can implement right away. That's why yep. enjoy. And often lots of new friends. Um, I also look forward to it from a, a networking and, and uh, connection standpoint as well. So, uh, Pat, thank you for for taking the time today. Um, and I'll get. It's always good to see you. And. Uh, so, two. I think I'm able to. Yes. Yeah, April 2. Yep. Yeah, I have, you, I have you kicking it off, I think, after Mike um, or something. Yeah, yep. And uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, and hey, everything that Pat mentioned, everything she referenced, we're going to get that stuff in the show notes. Um, so thank you all for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.